Have you ever wondered what it would be like to actually be transported into a non-Euclidean space? Well, in today's video, we're going to explore exactly that question. Welcome, I'm Terry Soule, and this is Programming Chaos, a channel devoted to fun and interesting programming projects to help you hone your programming skills. And today I'm going to be looking at non-Euclidean inversions, and these are geometric transformations that take an image or a tessellation in Euclidean space and convert it into a non-Euclidean space. In order to understand what an inversion is, it's helpful to start by thinking about reflection. So you're probably familiar with basic geometric reflections. I have a green point here and the red point is its reflection. The definition is the green and the red points are an equidistance from my line of reflection down the middle, and they're both on a line that is perpendicular to the line of reflection. That defines the reflection. If I move the green closer, the red has to get closer. If I move the green point further away, the red point gets further away. Well, imagine what would happen if we replaced the line of reflection with a circle. And now the idea is, if I have a green point, how is the red point going to be reflected around that circle? And the answer is, it can't be. Any transformation we do based on a circle doesn't meet the definition of a reflection. Instead, what we do is something subtly different, which is called an inversion. So here I have a green point, and the red point is the inversion of that green point. The geometric definition is both points are on a line coming from the center of the circle and the distance to both points multiplied together, so the distance to the red point times the distance to the green point, has to be equal to the radius of the circle squared. So distance to green times distance to red equals radius squared. And what this means, for example, is if I put the green circle right on the radius, the red circle should also be right on the radius so that the distances squared equal the radius squared. And in that sense, it feels a bit like a reflection, but if I move the green circle further and further away, notice that the red circle is only approaching the center of the circle. And the reason for that is as the green point goes off to infinity, in order for the product to be equal to r squared, the red point has to approach zero and vice versa. If I move the green point to the center, then the red point has to run out to infinity so that the product is still equal to the radius squared. So not quite a reflection, but it clearly has some similarities. This also explains a little bit about those images that I showed at the very beginning of the video. So you might have noticed, for example, that there was a gray area in the middle of the inverted image. Well, that's because the points in the middle, if I want red points inverted into the center, I need green points that are off at infinity. Well, if I have a fixed size image, there's nothing very far away, so nothing's going to be inverted into the center. And likewise, points at the center of the image are going to be scattered off towards infinity, and so you may have noticed that around the borders of the image, the pixels were suddenly getting separated because they're all getting sent way far away from each other. So, in a sense, if we were to undergo an actual circular inversion, parts of us towards the center of the circle would be scattered off to infinity and points that were further away would suddenly be compressed into the center of the circle. Not a very comfortable situation to be in. But how do we program this? Well, in order to program it, we need to calculate where the red point should be based on where the green point is. So given a point, we need to calculate the inversion. For a circular inversion, the formula is actually fairly simple. The new x value is equal to the old x value times the radius of the circle squared divided by the distance squared. And similarly, the new y value is equal to the old y value times the radius squared divided by the distance squared as given by these two formulas. Okay, so with those in mind, we can actually start writing a function to invert points for us. Let's go ahead and do that. 
For this project, I'm going to be doing the coding in Java using the processing environment. And if you have never used processing before, I've got a nice little intro video that I'll link here that you can start off with. But really, it's pretty easy to follow along with the code, even if you're not familiar with processing. You can download it if you would like from processing.org. And this is the sort of starting boilerplate for all processing programs. We have a setup function which sets up the program, in this case just saying that I want my window to be full screen. And then we have a draw loop that's going to loop over and over again to draw into that window. And in order to do my inversions, the first thing that I need is to know the radius. And I'll just set that at 350. And then I'm going to need to load an image. So I'm going to use processing's built in P image object for storing my image. And I will load it in my setup function. And you can load whatever image you want. I'm going to load a copy of the famous painting, The Scream. If you're not familiar with processing, Inside of the program folder, you need a folder called data, and then you put your image into that data folder. So this will be read out of the data folder. And now what I need is my invert function, which when given a point, calculates the inversion of that point. I'm going to define my points in terms of a two-dimensional vector. Again, processing is built in P vector object. So I will give my invert function a p vector, and then I'll return the inversion of the p vector. So the pieces that we need will be the new x and y position, and then it's helpful to calculate that distance squared so we can use it in our calculations. There we go. So this is the distance squared. In order for it to be the distance, I'd have to take the square root. And now I can calculate the x and y. So that gives me the x and y, and I just have to put those into a new p vector and return them. So this function, given a point defined as a p vector, will return a new p vector, which is the inversion of that point around a circle with whatever radius we want to define. So now all I need to do is go through each pixel in the image and take the location of that pixel and invert it and plot it at the new location. First, I'm going to fill in the background. And that will make it a light gray. And then I need my two P vectors, one for each pixel location and one for the inverted location. And I need to create new p vectors to go with them. And now I simply go through each pixel in my image, calculate the inverted location, and then plot the pixel at that new inverted location. So this will go through all the y locations through the height of the image. And this will go through all of the x locations. So that will take me through the entire image one pixel at a time. And I have to figure out the coordinates of each x and y so that I can invert them. And I'll plug those coordinates into my p vector so I can pass the p vector into my function. And so what I'm doing here is I'm taking the x coordinate and subtracting half of the width of the image. So normally, the upper left corner of the image would be the 0, 0 location. I actually want my 0, 0 to be in the center of the image. So this is doing that shift for me. And then I do the same thing for the y. So that gives me my p vector. And then I find the inversion of that p vector. And I'm using the same name for the vector as the function, which is not ideal, maybe in terms of keeping the code straight, but works perfectly well. And I need to know the color of the pixel so that I can draw the new pixel at the new location in the correct color. 
So what this is doing is getting from the image the pixel of XY and storing the color. And then I'm going to want to fill in with that color. And I'm actually going to draw a small circle at that location. So you might be thinking, and it makes sense, I just want to put a single pixel down. Well, as we get towards the edge of the inversion, as we saw, our pixels get scattered and they're hard to see. So I'm actually going to draw them as a teeny circle instead. It helps fill in the edges a little more. And again, because my zero location I want to be at the center of the screen. Normally in processing, zero, zero is the upper left-hand corner of my window. So I'm gonna add half the width to my X location so that my zero, zero is shifted over. And I'll do the same thing with the Y and add that to the inverted Y position. And then I'll just draw a little circle there, radius two. And there we go. That goes through and inverts the whole image. The other thing, I probably want to put in, and I can just do it up here in the setup, is a no stroke command so that I don't have a little outline around the outside of my circle. Okay, so let's give this a shot. And there we go. That is the screen inverted. I think a very appropriate image to be inverted. You thought the screen was a little horrifying before. Check it out after we've gone through a non-Euclidean inversion. You'll notice that we have the effects that I talked about before. The center of the image is blank because there are no pixels at infinity to be folded, if you will, into the center. And near the edges of the image, the pixels start to get scattered apart because those ones that were near the center of the image are starting to be pushed out towards infinity. And in fact, if I zoomed out, you'd see little circles like this scattered off to infinity. But we do have all of the other aspects of the image. So if you're familiar with the screen, there's a couple of people in the background. You can see them here. There's a bright red sunset there. There are some ships on the water. You can see them there. So we have all of the aspects, but twisted into this distorted non-Euclidean space. There are some other fun things that we can do with these sort of inversions. As I mentioned at the beginning, a very nice one is to take what's known as a tessellation. So a tessellation is when you take your plane and you cover it with some sort of shape that fills the whole space. So for example, a grid is a tessellation of squares. So let's take a look at that. Here's our tessellation. And here's what the circular inversion looks like. So you get this very interesting pattern. The green line here is the circle that we're inverting around. So some points get folded, if you will, inside the circle, and then other points get folded or inverted to the outside of the circle. And in this case, we can change the size of the circle. And you can see if the circle gets bigger, it's as if we're zooming in. And if we make the circle smaller, it's as if we're zooming out. So you can get some very cool effects by doing inversions and then changing the size of the circle that you're inverting around dynamically. If we do different tessellations, we can get different patterns. So imagine instead of a grid of squares, we instead have an array of circles. Here, I've covered the plane with circles. Technically, this is not actually a tessellation. For it to be a tessellation, the polygons have to fit together with no gaps. With circles, of course, I've got little gaps between them. So I've covered the plane, but I haven't tessellated it. But let's see what happens if we apply our inversion. So here, you'll notice something interesting. I still have perfect circles. And again, my green circle here is what I'm inverting around. So circles that were outside of my green circle are folded in. Circles that were inside are folded out. I can change the size of the circle to see the whole pattern, but you notice that I'm still dealing with circles. When I did a square tessellation, the squares were all deformed. When I do a circular inversion of circles, interestingly enough, the circular shapes are preserved. So what this means is if you ever do get stuck in a non-Euclidean space, but circles remain circles, or because you can do the same sort of transformation in three dimensions, if spheres remain spheres, then you know that you've undergone a circular inversion in particular. 
Okay, there are some other fun things that we can do with this. For example, we can color the circles based on their distance from the center, which gives an effect like this, where towards the center we get one color and as we move out we get changing colors. I've also adjusted the weights a little bit so we have thicker lines towards the outside and thinner lines towards the middle. So lots of fun things that you can do to get all sorts of different interesting geometric shapes with our inversions. This is just a circular inversion. We can also do an elliptical inversion. So the idea is similar. For a given green point, we have a red point which is the inversion of it. And again, they always match along the radius of the ellipse. And the formulas though are a little more complicated because they have to take into account the major axes A and the minor axes B for the ellipse. But these are the formulas that we would use and the result we get looks like this. So again, I've covered the plane with circles, but now I'm undergoing an elliptical inversion. And the x location of the mouse defines the major axis of the ellipse, and the y position of the mouse defines the minor axis of the ellipse. And so as I move the mouse around, the ellipse that I'm doing the inversion over is shifting and we can get all sorts of interesting effects. If I line them up so that I have approximately a circle, I go back to my circular inversion, but I can warp it by changing the dimensions of the ellipse that I'm doing the inversion over. It turns out that not only can you do circular and elliptical inversions, you can invert over a parabola or a hyperbola or lots of other shapes, and they all give their own unique distortions, which give these really cool visual effects, both for tessellations and other uniform patterns, and also, as we saw at the beginning, if you apply them to images. So lots of really cool things that you can do with non-Euclidean transformations. If you get anything really interesting, please feel free to put a comment down below. I'd love to hear what other people are doing with these sorts of transformations. Thank you and happy coding.